Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a very special webinar on assessing validation data in cannabis testing laboratories. And we're very excited to presenting with Halima Ali, who is the technical program manager and medical quality compliance manager of Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation, Inc. We're going to review the outline for today's event. Uh, first, Halima will review the highlights of ISO 17025 requirements for the validation of methods. Uh, she'll talk about how to set acceptance criteria based on the attended use of the results, how to record and analyze results for test method validations, and then how to document validation activities to demonstrate conformance to the standard. And when she's done, I will follow up with a quick introduction of how technology like Qualtrics helps laboratories document validation data with an automated process to demonstrate conformance to ISO 17025. Now, before we get started, I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, number one, if you have questions throughout the presentation today, please feel free to put those into the Zoom webinar application. Uh, and we're going to have about a 15 minute period towards the end of the presentation where we're going to answer those questions live. Uh, we do have a number, a large number of people on today's webinar. So we'll do our best to get through all the questions that you have. But we're not, if we're not able to get to your question, don't worry, we'll make sure that somebody reaches out uh, to get that answered. Um, also, this webinar will be recorded and available for everyone to either watch again or share with other colleagues and team members. Uh, it'll be available on the Qualtrics website, but then also will get sent out uh, in an email following the presentation once it's available. So I do want to introduce myself. My name is Karen Arribiaga, and I'm an account executive here at Qualtrics. And I mostly work with our laboratory prospects and customers who are either accredited or in the process of becoming ISO 17025 accredited. Now, we have a mix of attendees on here today. We've got some customers and some prospects, or prospects, everyone who some people have seen Qualtrics, some people have never even heard of Qualtrics. So before I introduce Halima, I'm going to quickly tell you a little bit about who we are. At Qualtrics, we take a technology team approach to our offering. Qualtrics is an all-in-one electronic quality management system truly designed to automate core ISO processes and alleviate compliance burden. You know, we pair that with our team commitment to our customers, the industries that they serve. So we find if we can truly understand the compliance burden you are under, we can make sure that it's top of mind when we're thinking about new product functionality and ultimately how we service our customer base. We ourselves are ISO 9001. Um, we actually use our own software to manage our own quality initiatives. And we've been helping organizations automate their quality management systems for over the last 26 years. Our customers include laboratories, manufacturers, and accrediting bodies, just to name a few. And to date, we're servicing many cannabis labs in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Colorado, California, Nevada, and Canada. We also have about a 97% customer renewal rate. And this is something that's quite important to us and something that we put a lot of energy into at our company. Uh, our customers provide us with great feedback on the product, what we can do to improve it. And in fact, we do about a, two or three major releases of our product a year with new features. And those new feature requests come directly from customer requests. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Halima. So Halima is a technical program manager for the accreditation of clinical testing laboratory and lends her expertise to general testing program activities at Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. She brings both clinical laboratory and medical device experience uh, to Perry Johnson's technical program and quality management teams. As a medical technologist at the bench and providing technical and application support, strong quality systems and regulatory compliance programs were also were always central to success in the laboratory. So at this turn, uh, Halima, if you want to join me, uh, you can go ahead and take control of the screen and share yours and start your presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Karen. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to quickly thank Qualtrics for um, partnering, par partnering with us and giving me the opportunity to talk on this topic. Um, it's something that I'm interested in. I've always been interested in validating and verifying methods. And so it's something I actually enjoy talking about. Um, so first I will start with um, telling you a little bit about uh, Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. Um, we are a third party private accreditation body uh, that accredits laboratories to ISO IEC 17025 
and the current standard is for 2017. Um, but we also have programs for some other standards as well. Um, for ISO 17020, 17034 uh, for uh, reference material pr producers. And then my program is the medical program, which is ISO 15189. Um, so uh, the bulk of, of what we do tends to be with 17025 uh, accrediting testing and calibration facilities worldwide. Our headquarters is in Troy, Michigan, um, but we also have offices in Mexico, Italy, Japan, and the UK. We have really made ourselves known, I think, in the cannabis industry. I am proud to say that PJLA accredits the majority of cannabis labs in the United States. And we accredited, accredited our first in 2009. Um, finally, PJLA is an MRA signatory of International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation and of the Asia Pacific accreditation cooperation for both testing and calibration. And I also put our website up here um, in case you have questions or would like some more information about us. And as Karen said, uh, these are my objectives, the things that I want to make sure that we touch on and talk about today. Um, making sure that you know what part of the 17025 2017 standard um, applies to verification and validation and what those clauses mean. Uh, also, um, I want to talk about intended use and why that is really important as you are putting together your plans uh, to validate a method or in selection of a method. Um, keeping records is extremely important, as many of you may already know. If you've been through um, an assessment uh, for accreditation to 17025, um, records are how we, we know things. Uh, I, I often say that the easiest way to demonstrate to someone that you've done something is to write it down or document it in some way, and that, that's where records come in for us. I spend a lot of quality time with different types of records. Um, and then finally, I want to make sure that uh, we talk about summarizing and presenting your validation results in a way that makes it easy and efficient for an assessor to come in and, and look at your, your work, your studies, the results of your validation, and the decisions that you've made the technical decisions you've made as far as um, your protocols and procedures and, and be able to look at it next to the, the 17025 standard and see conformance or non-conformance. So I want to take a quick stop to talk about regulatory and accreditation bodies. We are not the same. So regulatory is going to be federal and state organizations um, that usually are issuing license, licenses. Accrediting bodies like PJLA, we are looking for your conformance to a standard. However, we are not regulatory. And one of the reasons that I point this out is that there are a lot of situations where ISO 17025, the standard, says something, and then the regulations put forth by the state say something else. And so I want to make sure that there is that distinction between what I do as an assessor going into the laboratory versus when someone who is regulatory comes in. Regulatory is also about enforcement and I don't have enforcing capabilities. Um, I arrived there because you wanted me there um, to assess your system and see how you're doing as far as conforming or not conforming to the standard. Um, also, I wanna talk about our, the, the, one of the challenges that the cannabis industry, of course, is facing is that 
the federal statutes look at the cannabis industry or products in a different way than the states do, right? So marijuana is still a Schedule I substance under the Federal Controlled Substances Act. And that means that when states uh, decide to uh, legalize different applications or uses for marijuana or cannabis products, they are making up their own regulatory programming requirements. And they're not, they're not working together on these things. Each state is doing it themselves. And there is no guidance regarding um, things like do dosage, potency, um, what is, what truly deems something safe or unsafe um, in other uh, consumer markets, we have the FDA, for example, that has all of, all of these things already out there for you, standard methods and cutoff values and, um, and so forth. So one thing we do all share regulatory and accreditation bodies is that all, all of these programs have the same goal. And that's that we want to keep consumers safe and provide quality products. So most important, of course, is people are going to say, you know, we want safe cannabis products out there. And that's going to be achieved with appropriate testing to ensure the quality of the products. Um, using accurate test methods so that when you put a result out in the world, you are confident in everything that went into producing that result. Um, we want to make sure that everybody in the laboratories, we have competent testing personnel, that people are getting appropriate training on these different methods. Um, the greatest method in the world is not so great when it's in the hands of someone who may not uh, be familiar with all of the ins and outs of it. Um, so uh, we are also looking at having reliable processes to detect and prevent problems. So be detecting and preventing problems is before they occur, ideally, um, or before your result makes it out of the laboratory. Um, so all of these things, these items here, these are all covered in the ISO 17025 standard. That is the purpose of the standard is to have a standard way of addressing these important questions and, and issues. So it's laid out right there in the introduction to the standard. So the document contains requirements for laboratories to enable them to demonstrate they operate competently and are able to generate valid results. The important word here, as I've bolded it, is you have to be able to demonstrate what is going on in the laboratory. This document requires the laboratory to plan and implement actions to address risks and opportunities. This applies directly to validation of methods. It also applies to the selection of methods and whether you are able to use a method as written if it's a standard method, or whether you're going to need to make modifications to it. Um, and finally, the laboratory is responsible for deciding which risks and opportunities need to be addressed. So we as the accreditation body, the standard does not tell you what you have to deal with. That is up to the laboratory. And the laboratory is going to make good decisions based on the data that they're using, the data that is generated in their laboratory and by their practices. Okay. The matrix. This is a big challenge in the cannabis industry. Um, while you may have some uh, standard methods already out there from AOAC or um, some of the other uh, scientific bodies in the community, they often are not validated with cannabis. Um, they may be validated with a matrix that is relatable in the sense that much of the testing in cannabis laboratories is on plant material. So you may be able to find a standard method 
that is already validated using plant material. But things get interesting when you get to edibles and extracts and oils and from talking to uh, multiple laboratories uh, working with these materials, uh, gummies have their own set of issues <laughs> at times. They're hard to work with because of the different qualities of the matrix. And, and so the matrix always has to be taken into consideration when you're looking at methods. Um, if you are gonna have to modify a method, making sure that you address anything about the matrix that could change the performance of the method and whether those method, those performance changes are going to impact the, um, the intended use. Here we are in the intended use. So the, I think a lot in, in the form of questions. And so my first question when looking at intended use is how will these results be used? For the most part, they are used for safety, determining the quality of a product. And then in some cases with medical, um, with medical products, they are also looking at, at dosing in selecting a, a, a product for a, for a patient. Also looking at regulatory requirements. These are ready-made specificity and sensitivity requirements. Um, state, the challenge is that they are probably different in every single state. So it's really important that in your individual state that you make sure that you're looking at regulatory requirements. Because this is, an, er, this is a young industry, it's also constantly changing. Uh, almost weekly in some places. So that is very important to stay on top of that and use that information for looking at intended use and planning your validation studies. Um, make sh making sure that you are using your intended use then as you're looking at what are the acceptance criteria? What does a method have to be able to achieve in order to be acceptable as the right method for us as a laboratory, for what we are, for what we are reporting out there and what our clients need, why they need the information. Um, so that's going to be looking at your reporting ranges, sensitivity, repeatability, et cetera. Those things need to be set before you run the study. And then, of course, looking at risks and opportunities. Does a method pose any risk to the laboratory operations or the staff? And what I mean by that is looking at, you know, what is the hands-on time, how, uh, how technical or how complex is a method, um, how long does it take? All of these things should be coming into uh, the conversation as you're putting together your plan what are the risks to your operations or staff? Um, also, an important point here is that there should already be established labor laboratory acceptable risk levels. That is part of the 17025-2017 standard, is that the laboratory will have, uh, will have performed um, some type of risk assessment. It doesn't say what how you do the risk assessment, but simply that you must look at these, at these risks and have established levels that are acceptable. The part of the standard that we are looking at in general is 7.2, which covers uh, selection, verification, and validation of methods. And I wanna talk specifically about validation of methods. There, there's more work or you need to establish more performance criteria when you are looking at the validation of a method versus verifying a standard method. In validation of methods, you need to establish 
that the method can meet all of your acceptance criteria. So that's why I laid intended use right next to validation of methods. Okay, so everything on the intended use side, it's, it, we have looked at it previously, but now let's look at it in the context of the, the standard itself. So in the clause that the laboratory shall validate non-standard methods, laboratory developed methods, and standard methods used outside their intended scope or otherwise modified, and that the validation will be as extensive as is necessary to meet the needs of the given application or field of application. What that means is you have set your acceptance criteria, and so the validation should be extensive enough to demonstrate that all of those all of those parameters have been met. Another thing that I kind of want to touch on though is about what is a standard method versus a non-standard method. In ISO, a standard method is published by international, regional, or local uh, scientific organizations. Um, and the preference for selection of methods is that um, they be accepted or validated by these types of organizations. The, the types of validations that are done by these organizations, they're done in multiple, um, in multiple laboratories at multiple sites uh, by unrelated impartial laboratories. That is an important part of it. Um, so that, that would be a standard method. Non-standard method might be a method that you've come across in a publication that has been published. However, it has not been um, extensively validated uh, by multiple laboratories. Okay. So looking at selecting a particular method, um, when you're looking at the different methods, uh, do you have to modify a method? Is there a method that already exists that's going to work for you? Um, or are you going to have to actually develop your own in-house method. Um, if you're going to have to modify or develop a method, then you're going to have to do a validation of those methods. And so if you're going to do modifications, things that have to be considered in your plan is how will those modifications affect the relevant par parameters of the method, which remember we, we established in looking at our intended use. Uh, we also need to look at how modifications can affect uh, the relevant characteristics of the analyte itself being measured. And when I, um, that I really apply to the types of samples where you have to do some type of processing of the sample in order to measure the analyte and how is the analyte affected by uh, changes to um, the different characteristics of the different steps in the method. So when uh, we're, our next clause then is 7222, and we're looking at when the changes are made to a validated method, the influence of such changes shall be determined and where they are found to affect the original validation, a new method validation shall be performed. So this is about how a, a method once validated is not necessarily going to be unchanged forever. Anytime in, in the use of that method, if, if it is modified in some way, this needs to be evaluated each time and determined whether you need to do another validation to make sure that with the modifications, it's still meeting all of the criteria, the acceptance criteria for the method um, as they apply to your intended use. 
One thing that I like about the 17025 standard is that it really is geared towards laboratories. It's satisfying customers, the customer's requirements. And so I think it's important then to identify who are these customers and where, what kind of requirements are they going to have. So in, in general, we have growers, consumers, and regulators. And so all of these types of customers have, they have certain needs as far as what they are going to do with their results. And so you, the laboratory itself also needs to look at the requirements uh, of a method to maintain the quality of the laboratory. Is a, a particular method um, going to be able to meet the requirements for continuing to provide consistent service and accuracy of, of your results. Um, do you need to have more staff? Are there, is there a new consumable that you have to start purchasing? And what is the runtime? I mean, turnaround is extremely important um, for, for most customers. They want it fast and they want it right. And they want it now. Um, so then looking at where that fits into the standard and why as an assessor, I am looking at your customer's requirements in addition to what the laboratory, what are the laboratory's needs out of a method. So the performance characteristics of the validated methods as assessed for intended use will be relevant to the customer's needs and consistent with the specified requirements. Now we get to where um, I want to talk about um, demonstrating that you're conforming to the standard. And this is where records come into play. And you can bet that looking at the A through E uh, listed under the clause for records, we are going to ask about every single one of these records. Um, you have to have a validation procedure. Um, you must have stated specifications of the requirements. This needs to be recorded. And then as you are meeting or not, as a method is meeting or not meeting the requirements, that should be recorded as well. Uh, determination of performance characteristics of the method, um, data packages of the results, uh, the actual results that were obtained, and then a statement on the validity of the method detailing its fitness for the intended use. This particular part of the clause can be a little deceptive. A statement on the validity, validity of the method, but it should detail its fitness for the intended use. The point that I wanted to make with this is that this is bigger than one sentence. We need the details of why this method is fit for the intended use. And it should be, well, it shall be recorded. Um, and so in all, keeping all of these records, I want to touch on making sure that as you are designing documents or record keeping systems, that you make sure that you're capturing the information that you need for analysis. I, I often see with, particularly with laboratory design forms for capturing things like um, corrective actions, um, for example, um, they capture a lot of information that isn't really needed for, for later analysis, right? We keep records so that we can look at them later and draw some kind of conclusion or get some type of information from the information from the data there. And so when you're making documentation, or designing documents and record keeping tools, make sure that they are designed for 
capturing what you need. Make them useful, not just something to, that you have to have because the standard says that they shall be retained. Um, your validation plan will include the specifications and determination of the performance characteristics. Then there should also, there will also be the validation procedure, which will include how the data are recorded and then analyzed for the selected parameters. So you may get, um, you may do a calibration curve and determine the range that you want to be able to measure within. It needs to be a part of the procedure, the validation procedure of what are you going to do with the data that you have and how are you, how does that data relate to the intended use. And then in the recording of results, going back to designing how you're going to do that, and the, my uh, webinar partner here has a beautiful tool for recording results and making sure that they get recorded. And the best way to do that is to make it easy. Make it easy to complete the records that you need to keep. Um, and I, I can go back to the example of corrective actions. On these forms, there tends to be a lot of free text area that has to be written out and filled out extensively. That could be made much easier if there was a way to design in maybe some drop down options where if it's a digital document, drop down menus or have ready-made statements that you can select from. It makes it easier and it will make record keeping more consistent. The, your assessors will want to look at validation packages. So the way that you put your package together is really important in how the assessor is going to be able to determine if you have conformed to the standard in your validation. So the presentation of the, the data and your analysis should demonstrate that the principles of the standard were followed in planning, performing, and documenting the validation. Um, part of the validation package needs to be measurement on certainty, which tends to be a can of worms, depending on um, the type of method and your testing area. Um, measurement uncertainty is, is really confusing when you're doing semi-quantitative uh, semi or qualitative uh, validations for a method. So um, make sure that if you're doing a quantitative Quantitative method that the measurement uncertainty has been determined if it's going to be reported as a pass or fail or acceptable unacceptable make sure that you have a decision rule associated with how the measurement uncertainty is applied to make that conforming statement I could do five webinars on measurement uncertainty so I'm going to move on from it at this point and talk about summarizing your data analysis. Um, on a few occasions, uh, the validation packages that I've received have been Excel spreadsheets with many numbers on them. And it's, and it's good data. There's nothing wrong with this data. Where I am at a disadvantage is I don't, don't know what this data is for. And so it's very helpful if I can have a summary of what type of what is what are the data that you were collecting or generating from your test method and then what are you doing with it to be able to see what type of analyses that you're doing in um, in evaluating your validation um, 
also being able to look at finally this is um, this is about that state making that statement that is more than a sentence and making sure that you are able to answer this question that based on the results of the performance studies performed in the laboratory for the relevant parameters is the method fit for intended use so these are all the things that should be hit upon when you are accepting the method it's also important to make sure that as I stated earlier about validations, that you don't just validate the method and say that you're done evaluating how a method is performing. You need to make sure that you are building into your procedures and processes quality control checks to make sure that the method continues to meet the criteria that, what, that were set for the intended use. And so part of the validation package should include quality control uh, strategies for the particular method. Um, also part of the package that goes along with the quality control and monitoring um, ongoing quality and performance of the method is doing proficiency testing with that method. Um, there are, um, the programs are getting stronger. The more states that start, um, that legalize uh, cannabis, the stronger those programs become because they get more and more uh, laboratories that are participating. So the information coming from proficiency test programs is getting better uh, when you are looking at your performance against the rest of the industry. Um, so I, I would strongly suggest being, being a real advocate and being very engaged with proficiency programs and as they're being developed. Um, the engagement of everybody in the industry is, is important uh, to make sure that the information coming out of these programs is, is useful. Okay, so let's go back to our objectives and look at how we've covered things here. So going over the validation of method requirements in the standard itself. Method validation is covered in 7.2.2. Use that intended use to set your exceptions criteria. Use all of the information, all of who your customers are. What do your customers want from your methods? And what do you need from your methods? Make sure that you are retaining results, uh, records of your results, and that you are performing regular data analysis on those results. Summarizing and presenting the validation materials, the purpose of creating a, a validation package is so that you are able to demonstrate that you are conforming to the standard. So when you are putting together a validation package, have the standard right there and look at what you're putting together and are you conforming to the standard. Um, make it as easy for yourself as possible. The first time is the hardest one. It requires the most work. Once you've got it down, create templates so that you can keep applying a good validation plan to things that are coming on new. Uh, when you do want to bring in that next, next method, you'll have everything in place ready to roll. And and finally, making sure that, that you make the best use of software that is available to you. Um, I mentioned before, using dropdowns, uh, standardizing how um, even descriptions of information is, is recorded. And then my, my final thoughts that I wanted to share with everyone. Um, 
validation packages should be designed for easy review so that that saves the assessor time. If your validation package is designed for an easy review by someone else, the assessor can look at all of this before they ever get on site. So that when they're on site, the, the emphasis can be on how you're using your method day to day. And in observing people actually doing the work. I can read anywhere. When I come into the laboratory, the, the interesting part is being there with people running the tests and seeing how they do science. Um, put your validation packages together so that you can use it later as a quick reference um, in developing other methods or um, if you want to be able to use that data again. Uh, easy access to the required records that we are going to ask for when we come on site. You may not necessarily send us all the records ahead of time, but once we get there, we do need to see them. And so this, all of this in putting your, considering all of these things as you're putting together a validation package will make that quicker and easier. And I wanted to invite you also that if you have, if you would like more information or have questions, if you are still looking for an accreditation body who understands you and understands the challenges of uh, the cannabis industry, I do hope that you will have a look at uh, Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. And thank you very much for listening. I really have enjoyed myself. I hope you have too. Great, Halima. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm going to steal the screen from you real fast. And if you could confirm for me that you can see my screen, see a big giant Q? Yes, I do. Wonderful. Well, no, thank you so very much. I think that presentation was very nice. And I think what I really like is you went in through the actual standard from intended use all the way to demonstrating conformity and really gave people an idea of, of what is involved with that. So thank you so very much. Um, so from a Qualprep tracks perspective, you know, we're usually speaking with laboratories who are questioning, okay, now that I know what I need to do, how am I going to go about doing that? And that's where some of these questions come to mind. You know, how am I going to compile this data? How am I going to quickly report on it? Uh, how am I going to guarantee that data isn't lost or accidentally erased or even logged incorrectly? You know, what if I lose a team member and I need to make sure the company has the complete data so I can easily move forward after that person is gone? But then most importantly, and this is what we hear often, is how I'm going to make, how am I going to show and demonstrate conformity without loading our team members with a lot of administrative work, you know, really taking them away from their other responsibilities? And when we talk to our cannabis laboratories, you know, it's very common that quality managers that we hear, are, they're wearing multiple hats in the organization. Sometimes they're the owners and they're just getting started. You know, sometimes they're the lab directors or the um, operations individuals. Um, and sometimes they're, they're true quality managers. And so what Qualtrax is allowing them to do is manage quality with all the necessary details that it requires, you know, without limiting their time. So how does Qualtrax help with this? Um, there really are some, some key benefits to our system. You know, number one, it's gonna give you better visibility. Everyone needs visibility into your data. When you have a manual system, you find yourself going through spreadsheets, you find yourself trying to create access databases or actually going through binders that you might have in the laboratory trying to compile information. So what Qualtrax is doing is putting everything in one location so you can easily search and find that information when needed. And again, cutting time with that. Um, it also helps increase efficiencies. You know, one of the biggest time savings benefits of our system is the ability to alleviate basic administrative workload. And quality managers who aren't using electronic quality management systems can find themselves chasing down colleagues and paperwork or constantly updating spreadsheets or swimming in a sea of emails to make sure their, their T's are crossed and their I's are dotted ultimately. So what Qualtrics is doing is taking these administrative tasks off their plate and automating it through the system. And it can significantly help reduce things like audit prep time and even just maintaining their quality systems. 
It also can help increase accountability. So by using Qualtrics, it will hold your organization accountable to your customers, you know, the growers, the accrediting bodies, um, even your internal stakeholders to that standard. Um, so, you know, say what you do, do what you say, and then be able to show that you did it is kind of the idea around ISO. And so what it's going to do, it's going to hold you and your colleagues accountable by managing individual tasks and sending out constant reminders, holding everyone accountable for their own responsibilities. And then it will also help decrease risk. Uh, this is a big one. And in fact, you heard at the beginning of Halima's presentation, she, men she mentions identifying risks and opportunities for improvement. So when implementing Qualtrics, you're embedding a culture of quality and continuous improvement uh, within your organization. And as a result, you are more aware of events or incidents that could occur to jeopardize your organization. And so what Qualtrics will do is, again, give you that visibility to identify these risks and then give you a configurable platform so you can make adjustments to your quality management system. You know, at the core of it, Qualtrics is truly designed to help build confidence among your customers. You know, again, whether these are internal stakeholders or external customers or accrediting bodies, that confidence is, is what's going to really help show that um, you guys are, are have a true quality system. So how does Qualtrics do that? We have some core features of our product. Now Qualtrics, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, is an all-in-one compliance management solution. So what that means is that these core features are available to you to use at your discretion. What these are, document management, so guaranteeing that nobody's gonna get their hand on a document that's out of date and really controlling that full versioning and edit life cycle of the document process. And what this is doing is replacing the need to manually update a master document list for your organization, because you can just report on it. Workflows, automating processes. So think of some of those core ISO processes that you have to automate or that you have to prove conformance to, corrective action requests, internal audits, and so on and so on and so on. The list can, can grow. Testing and training, so tracking competency and awareness. And then all three of these sit on top of a reportable platform. As you're putting information into Qualtrics, being able to report on that quickly through System reports, but even your own custom reporting is something that you'll be able to do in the system. Now, what we're going to focus on today is the workflow portion of the product, uh, specifically around validations. And so I'm going to quickly take you into the system. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is log in as Trevor, and I'm logging into a hosted platform. I'm accessing Qualtrics from a web browser like this, and so you can access it from anywhere. We see a lot of cannabis organizations that have multiple locations, and so this is a great way to have everybody on one system. The first time you log into Qualtrics, you're going to come to your inbox. Now, keep in mind, Trevor is a quality manager. He's got a lot that he needs to do in Qualtrics. Some people will log into the system, and maybe the only thing that they'll see is a test and training they need to take, and maybe the area to view documents. When you're in the system, you'll notice that you have a list of tasks to complete. Well, those tasks are going to be tied to this legend up here. And this legend is going to be also integrated with emails that are being sent out automatically with the system. Those emails are gonna get sent out on um, every time something is newly added, approaching its due date, late, or needs to be expedited. And this is really where you start thinking about some of the time savings associated with quality. When you think about the validation process that we're gonna go into, at each different step, automatic email notifications are gonna get sent out to your team members. So let's dive into workflows. I'm going to come over here to the left and click on the workflow area, and you'll see when I pull it down, there's a number of examples here. When you purchase Qualtrics, you're going to get our best-in-class workflows that really pertain to some of those core ISO uh, processes, so corrective action requests, internal auditing, proficiency testing, risk assessment, validation, and vendor approval. Then you also have access to customer complaints and management review as well. We're going to go to validation since that's the topic of today's presentation. And when I come here, what you're going to see is that first step in that validation process. So step one is going to be initiating that validation. So if I scroll down here to the diagram below, this is showing you what this validation process looks like. With this process, think of it as a fillable form. And for every single time that somebody, if this goes from one step to another, those automatic email notifications are going to get sent out to the next appropriate person or group of individuals in line where they're going to get notified and be continually notified until they finish that part of the process. By controlling a process like this and controlling exactly what they need to fill out at each step of the process, you get to lock down and really control 
the information that's coming in. And so Halima, one of the things that she mentioned was select lists um, and making sure that you are giving people choices. However, those choices are going to be very important to you and what you have in your laboratory. And so the system will allow you to do that. So step one in here is initiating that validation. You would choose what section, you would choose the topic or the instrumentation that you're validating. You're gonna choose the responsible party. And this in this demo system is pulling a list of individuals and groups that you could pull in to send this next notification to. I'm gonna clear this. Oh, I hit somebody, we'll just hit remove. So after the initiation step is done, you would hit initiate and it's gonna automatically go to the next appropriate person that you selected in line. Again. They're going to receive that email notification. At that point, they'll go into the workflow, see the data that was submitted at step one, and then have additional fields that they need to fill out. Again, you're really controlling that process. It will eventually get sent out to validation approval, and then you'll perform that validation and you'll go to the results summary, and then eventually it'll go to the review of completed validation. Now at this step, you have three options. It might need more testing. If that's the case, you choose that option. It'll go back to the results summary step. You might find that the validation needs to be submitted by QA because it's gotten past this step. Well, then you can submit it to QA. Or you might find that the, the, the plan needs to be completely revised. And at that case, you can send it all the way back here. What Qualtrics is doing, again, as this form grows with more information, we're capturing all of that data automatically for you. And then you are able to report on that information. So if I come up here to the advanced search, and I'm gonna show you two ways of searching within Qualtrics. This is a quick, easy way to search just to get some high level information about all of the validation data that you have in your system. So if I click search, it's gonna pull up about a couple of instances of validations that we have going through our system. Now this is a demo system, I'll warn you. And so our, our data is not too complete with all of the details, but it will at least give you an idea of what it can do for you. You can see that we have the title, the current step. You'll see that we have got a number of them in different steps of the process, who initiated it, the start date, the end date, and what, info, what are we actually validating. So at any point, I want to come here, this one's closed, I could click this ID and it's going to take me directly into that record where I can see all of the details about that validation. You know, who did what at what step of the process? This is that full audit trail of who's doing what what section of the laboratory, the instrument um, or information, who's the responsible party, this is your validation plan that you can pull up, what are the supporting documents, and then what are the comments associated throughout the rest of that process. You know, Qualtrics is going to be capturing that information and asking people throughout that process to fill in that information. And so you have a choice of, of what those fields are going to be in that process. The other reporting option that you have is through our reports area. So I'm gonna quickly type on this validation report. The nice thing about reports is that you can schedule them. So as you're configuring them, as you're creating them, you can schedule them to automatically be sent to your inbox on a regular basis. So we'll have organizations send document reports to their inboxes, corrective action requests. Managers wanna see every corrective action that's being uh, submitted on a weekly basis, popular report that you can send to them on a routine uh, basis. And so I'm gonna go ahead and run this report, but you can kind of get an idea of how detailed you can be in that reporting. And when I get here, I'm noticing some of this information down here. I'm like, well, this is some pretty high level information. I need to see more in this reporting. Maybe we're gonna bring this up in one of the team meetings we're gonna have. I need more details. Well, you would just come up here to our report designer, go to the fields area, and now I can see all of the fields that I have been collecting through this process, and I can simply add them to this report. Hit save and run report. Come back here, run report, and now I have all the details associated with that process. At any point, with any report that you would run in our system, whether it has to do with a workflow or documents or testing and training, you have the ability to export them to CSVs and Excel documents. So if you do need to share them externally, if you need to share reports with your auditor, which is something that uh, we see a lot of our customers do, you can quickly do that. So when I started talking about reporting, I mentioned, or not reporting, workflows, I mentioned our best in class. Our best in class are gonna be those ones that are 
come out of the box ready to use. All you have to do is assign different people to the different roles uh, within Qualtrics to get those started. However, you're not going to be limited to those. It is very common and one of the, the nice things about Qualtrics where we have organizations that will create their own workflows. We give you a workflow designer. It works very similar to Microsoft Visio. You can use that to automate your different processes. And so we've had some um, of our cannabis laboratories create workflows around closing checklists, um, calibration logs, or um, opening checklists, or humidity monitoring logs, equipment maintenance and calibrations, reagent prep, the list goes on and on and what you can do. Because at the end of the day, what workflows are going to do for you, it's give you an ability to automate those processes to make them more efficient for your laboratory. That was a very high level of Qualtrics, especially the workflows. Um, if, at all interested in learning more, please let us know. I'm going to go back to my presentation and invite uh, Halima to come back on. Um, this is my this is our contact information. So if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to dive in deeper um, with, the, with them. So at this point, Halima, if you want to join us. Yes, I'm here. Great. And everybody, please feel free to put um, questions and answers into the Q&A section. Um, and we will go through those uh, and uh, make sure that everyone gets their questions answered. All right, Halima, I do have one question. Um, what are the greatest differences between 2005 and 2017 that I should be aware of as I set up my strategy for quality management planning? Um, I think probably the biggest difference is that when, uh, with 2017, it is, it was, it was designed and laid out so that it, is more complementary to 9001 2015. Uh, it is more process based. So what I find in looking at the two and how uh, between 2005 and 2017, how laboratories have, have worked their transition, I think one of the big challenges is that 2005 was much more prescriptive. It, stated more clearly exactly what you should do and what you should have. And 2017 doesn't do that. 2017 is not as, as amenable to a checklist type system. Um, we still kind of think of it that way because when we, when we do, we as assessors are writing findings, they are clause based. And so we do treat it more as a checklist, but I think internally in your laboratory, um, you want to look at process. Um, the way that the clauses are laid out in 2017 is that a finding written to a single clause, it's not going to be easy to zero in and say, I'm just going to fix this one thing. Um, so that, that would be probably the thing that, that I would encourage most. Um, in, in my labs that are transitioning from 2005 to 2017 is really look at process and look at sections and groups of clauses versus single individual clauses. Mm -hmm. And I can even add to that from the Qualtrics perspective, you know, with cannabis labs and especially the industry growing that it, that it, and how it is growing and more and more labs are coming, um, are coming up on a, on a regular basis, we're actually seeing some of our cannabis laboratories join and purchase Qualtrics in the very beginning stages. And the reason why they're doing that is because, some, because of kind of the process automation. The system is allowing them to automate the processes in Qualtrics to meet 17025-2017 um, and automate them from the start. And so before they even start testing, before they're even accredited, they're getting some of these set up right from the beginning in the system. And so it, it really is saving them time further down the road. Great. Well, and Alima, remind me, remind us here, how, what's the best way to reach out to you and Perry Johnson? Um, our website is pjlabs.com. And then if you would like to email me directly, it is H-A-L-L-I, so first initial and last name, at pjlabs.com. 
Great. And we did have one other question that just popped in. Do sure. you have any resources for getting quantitation methods that we could look into? Um, AOAC is probably one of the most looked to organizations for analytical methods. Um, also the USP, um, the pharmacopoeia um, group of different methods. Um, that's, those are probably two really big ones that I think you would, you would find um, good, good methods to, to start with. Great. Up. Oh. Yes. Up. Oh, she said, "What is the second one?" <laughs> Say that second one again. Oh, the USP. That help, Megan. Thanks. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Well, we're we're at time. So thank you, everybody for joining us today for this great webinar. Halima, we can't thank you enough for, for joining us and um, we're excited to continue to do some of these in the future with you guys. Great, thank you so much. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Wonderful. All right, if anybody has questions, you know how to get a hold of us. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye.